It's a pleasure to be with the saints at uh, Bethany Bible Chapel in Yonkers. And one of these days, uh, Faith and I, we'd love to be back with you in person, singing together, worshiping together, face to face, person to person. And so we look forward to that time in the will of the Lord. Um, I'll be with you tonight, of course, and then next week. And uh, I hope to have a two-part uh, two part, uh, study together with you on Ephesians. Ephesians chapter 3, the second prayer of the Apostle Paul uh, found in Ephesians chapter 3, uh, beginning in verse 13 and runs until verse 21. And um, I trust this will be a very profitable and encouraging time. It's a uh, it, it's in my study, in my preparation, and just in my uh, in time before the Lord. It's been a real, it's been a real blessing, and uh, I have been challenged and encouraged by it. And so uh, I look forward to the time tonight to share it with you. Uh, tonight we'll be only looking at the first half, and then next week we'll be looking at the second half. Um, the Book of Ephesians, as you all know, is a prison epistle. The Apostle Paul. Um, wanted to made it known when he was in prison at Caesarea that he wanted to appeal his case to Rome. And so he was taken to Rome and he was put in prison awaiting a trial. And while he was in prison, he wrote four prison epistles. Ephesians is one of them. Philippians is another one of them. Colossians is another. And then he also wrote uh, the letter of Philemon. Um, and so these are the prison epistles, and uh, it's just tremendous. The Lord, how the Lord, while the Apostle Paul was in prison, how the Lord used him and blessed him. And, um, and so we are going to look at this, uh, this passage, chapter 3, verses 13 through 21. And we're only going to look at half of it uh, this evening. So with your Bibles open, I am going to read um, the first four verses first four verses of this prayer of the apostle. Wherefore, I desire that ye faint not at my tribulations for you, which is your glory to your benefit. For this cause, I now bow my knees unto the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, of whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named, that he would grant you according to the riches of his glory, that you be strengthened with might by the Spirit in the inner man, and that Christ might dwell in your hearts by faith, that you being rooted and grounded in love may comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and the length and the depth and the height, and to know the love of Christ which passes knowledge that you might be filled with all the fullness of God. Now unto him who is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think, according to the power that works in us, unto him be glory in the church by Jesus Christ throughout the ages, world without end. Amen. I said I would read only four verses, but once I started reading them, I couldn't stop reading this tremendous prayer of the Apostle Paul. It's interesting when you come to, the, to, this, to this prayer, and when you come to this book, you see a prayer of the Apostle Paul here in chapter 3. You see a prayer of the Apostle Paul in chapter 1, verse 15 to the end of the chapter. In the letter that he wrote to the Philippians in chapter 1, again, you see a prayer of the Apostle Paul. When you go to the letter of the Colossians, Again, in chapter one, you see another prayer of the Apostle Paul. And it just struck me, isn't this unusual? Isn't this unusual to see uh, these prayers? Usually when we say they will pray for someone, uh, they'll pray privately uh, in their prayer room, in, their, in a, a bedroom or in a living room, or a place where they open the scriptures and read, a private place, uh, and they pray privately, not knowing what the other person is praying about. But there's an interesting principle in Scripture. I think you see it over and over again. 
that men and women, the Lord Jesus himself, uh, men who prayed, uh, prayed so that the hearers could hear their prayers. Um, we read, of course, in Matthew, go into your closet and pray, and that's a, a good principle. But isn't it interesting how often those who are being prayed for heard the words of the prayers that men made for them? We see it here. Can you imagine the recipient, the Church of Ephesus, uh, hearing the prayer, the words, the topics, the sentences, the expressions of the Apostle Paul for them? What a powerful impact that must have met, uh, must have been for them to read this tremendous prayer uh, of the Lord. I bow my knees unto the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ for you. And of course, in chapter one, and it's interesting, the Lord Jesus prayed his high priestly prayer in uh, John chapter 17, and, the and part of that prayer was for the disciples. And apparently the disciples, at least one of them, heard that prayer, was able to record it, hearing the prayer of the Lord Jesus for them. On the cross of Calvary, the Lord Jesus, while on the cross, book of Isaiah chapter 53 and, and verse 12, tells us that the Lord made intercession for the transgressors. There in the last moments of their life, life ebbing uh, away from the Lord himself and uh, and these, two, and these two men, he's praying for them. They're hearing him pray for them. And he must have prayed for their salvation. Because the one thief says, come down from the cross, save yourself and save us too. Maybe the, the salvation of these two thieves were on the lips of the Lord Jesus. But I say all this to say this. Isn't it interesting? That when the Lord, when the Apostle Paul, when he prayed, others heard the prayers for them. And I might suggest to you, there might be a principle in that for us. I think we should more often, when someone comes to us with a need, you may be at the chapel during a break, and an older brother, an elderly man may come to you and, and, and share a need in his life. And sometimes we say, well, I'll pray for you later, but wouldn't it be a good thing? Go to a quiet place in the chapel, another room outside in a hallway, and bow for a few minutes and pray for that brother, having him hear your words, your address to the Lord Jesus Christ, your address to God for him about that need. When you're visiting somewhere in a home and there's a need that's expressed before you leave, say, let's bow before the Lord and let's bring that need before him. And that family or that, that husband and wife hearing you pray about that need, what a powerful impact that must have had. And so tonight, as we look at this passage, the believers, this letter being brought by Tychius, most likely, most, most likely we read about him in chapter five, most likely him bringing the letter and as someone from that church, from that local assembly, rises and reads this letter, and they get to chapter one, and they get to chapter three, and they hear the words of the apostle praying publicly for them. What an impact that makes upon our lives. And so it's a good principle. It's a good principle uh, to pray in the presence of others. Pray for them publicly that they can hear it. And I want to suggest this too. I make this a practice for myself. When I meet someone, I may be going door to door in some cases, or I meet someone, uh, wherever it may be. And uh, before we leave and before we break up, I'll say to them, is there anything I can pray for you about? And what's very interesting is even if that's a hardened person to the gospel, as soon as I say to them, is there any need in your life that I can pray for you about? the demeanor changes. It begins, the conversation begins to flow. They begin to bring out request, sometimes request after request. And it's a tremendous thing to be able to pray for them. There's times I've gone back to the same home 
and prayed for them again and come back to them and asked them, what did the Lord do about that request? What did the Lord do about that prayer? And re and revisit that conversation we had with them. And so public prayer is important. Praying for those you come to know is important. But another principle, I think, is prayer. Paul praying twice in this chapter, we begin to see prayer is a powerful principle, a, a powerful practice of the Apostle Paul, a practice of the Lord Jesus. We see prayer over and over again. In Luke's gospel, we find the Lord Jesus praying 15 times. It's the most of any gospel. The Lord praying for his disciples and praying for others. They've seen in the seen the Lord himself in prayer. This is a tremendous thing. While in prison, the apostle Paul is able to serve the Lord. We find from the very end of chapter um, of chapter 28 and verse 31, 32, it says, while he was in prison, he, he preached about the kingdom of God and gave instruction about the things concerning the Lord Jesus Christ, uh, no man forbidding him. He was able to minister. But one of the things I think he was able to do, even though he was barred by the barriers of prison walls, though he was barred with the uh, chains, we read about chains in chapter uh, in, in chapter five. Though they're chains, those are prison walls, he can still serve the Lord. Though he's behind prison walls, he can still pray. Though he's forbidden from speaking to others in, in certain ways, he can still lift open his mouth and use his lips to pray for others. And this is a tremendous ministry we have. You may be shut in with health. You may not be able to go out to meetings. Um, whatever the reason may be that you are limited in meeting with other believers, you can still pray. And I want to read a quotation. It's really encouraged my heart by a, a preacher from a former day, by a man named J.C. Ryle. Uh, J.C. Ryle ministered in the 1800s. Uh, on into the early 1900s. Uh, he was from Liverpool, England. He was a prolific writer, wonderful preacher. And uh, he says this about prayer. And I remember he had a long ministry in a, in a church with families and believers. Here's what he says from his experience. He says this, never, never let us forget the children for whom many prayers have been offered seldom finally perish. Isn't that encouraging? Never let us, never, never let us forget that children for whom many prayers are offered seldom, not it doesn't say that they never do. But what an encouragement. Seldom, he says, from his experience, do they finally perish. What an encouragement. What a power there is in prayer. And then he says this, such prayers are heard on high. Such prayers will bring down blessing. Let us pray more and more for our sons and our daughters and our grandsons and our granddaughters and her nieces and her nephews and children our local assembly and one another. It's a great, great need for that prayer, for that prayer ministry. And so may we labor in that. Well, let's get into the specifics of this, uh, of this prayer of the Apostle Paul in chapter three. And uh, one of the first things he says in verse 13, he said, I don't want you to faint about my tribulations for you. Being in prison, there was persecution. There was physical, probably physical uh, persecution because of his faith in the Lord Jesus, because of his appeal to Caesar. When we read the last parts of, of Acts 28, it appears to be a comfortable thing. The Apostle Paul is in a rented house and others can come to him. But then we read in other places of persecutions and afflictions and chains and imprisonment. And he says, wherefore, I desire that you faint not at my tribulations for you, which is for your glory or for your benefit. 
And then he says this in verse 14. For this cause I bow my knees unto the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, of whom the whole family in heaven and earth are named. One of the first things I want to say is, uh, what does he mean? What does he mean by what he says in verse 15? Of whom the whole family of heaven and earth is named. At the outset, some, some commentators suggest that it's speaking of creation. It's speaking of different nations of the world. Speaking of angels, created beings. Uh, of different types in heaven, seraphim and cherubim, and those around the throne of the Lord Jesus and the, uh, and, and the living creatures, all of created beings in heaven and all the families of earth. And that can be very, very well. That, that could be the interpretation of this verse. But when, he, when you think about him writing to these believers, when you think he's writing to believers in, in, in Ephesus that were primarily from a Gentile background, and some may have been from a Jewish background, but primarily from a Gentile pagan background, a city that the uh, Temple of Diana, one of the eight wonders of the world, was found. And uh, it is said to have 5,000 temple prostitutes and, and pagan worship and pagan gods and temples to pagan gods were uh, the city was filled with them, and here you have Gentiles coming out of that background, coming to faith in the Lord Jesus. We know there was persecution of those believers when they first came to the Lord Jesus Christ. Some of them may have come from a slave background. Some of them may have uh, uh, had to leave their former lives, whatever work they had, because of persecution. I wonder if he's speaking when he speaks in verse 15, of whom the whole family of earth is named, he's making a reference to these Gentiles who came to faith in the Lord Jesus, and he wanted them to know they were not unknown by God the Father. They may have been forgotten by the world, but they were not forgotten by God. They may have cast aside by the world and their former friends and former associates and former employers but they were not far, forgotten. They were not forsaken by God himself. This is a precious, precious thought to realize that these believers, unknown by the world, insignificant by the world, forgotten by the world and former associates and former friends and former family members, but yet they're in Christ, and yet they're believers who belong to the Lord Jesus Christ. And God the Father has his eye upon them. God the Father is guiding, protecting, leading them, counseling them, encouraging them as they make their way through the world. He has his hand of protection upon them. And I wonder if that's what Paul wanted to make known to these Gentile believers. They belong to the Lord now. There's a passage in Galatians chapter 4 and verse 9. And it says something like this, speaking about those who came from also a, 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 a Gentile background. Um, he says this, he says this, he says, now that you have known God, yea, rather are known by God. What a great truth. It's one thing for us to come to faith in the Lord Jesus Christ and know him. But the apostle Paul says to these Gentile believers, but much more. Yea, much more rather, God knows you. Let that sink into our hearts. God knows us. God protects us. God's working in our lives. You know, we can say we know someone who has some fame in this world. We know about him. But God knows us. When I grew up, uh, in the midweek meeting, we all got on our knees and prayed. And I know that's not probably the common practice for many of you, but that's what I remember growing up for all of my life, uh, all my young life. And here he says, for this cause I bow my knees unto the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. 
But I want you to notice something in this passage. He says this, for, uh, for this cause I bow my knees, and see this little word, the word unto in your Bibles. I'm reading from the King James Bible. And in the King James Bible, it has a word unto. Many other Bibles have a different word there. And the word unto gives the idea of speaking from a distance, speaking to God. We, we address him, ourselves to God. But the Greek word here is the word pros, P-R-O-S. Many translations uh, translate the word to pray before God, at the feet of God, as if, as if he was uh, uh, praying at the throne, before the throne of God. That word is interesting, 3 John, in verse 14, don't turn to it, but it says this, I trust to see you shortly and to come to you and speak to you face to face. That's the same Greek word, face to face. In John 1.1, 1, 1, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The word with God is the same word, pros. It means intimacy. It means in the same presence. We come before God as if we were at the foot of, at the feet of the Lord Jesus as he is on the throne, and we are in his presence. Many translations use the word before God. We, I bow my knees before God the living God. And it speaks of reverence. It speaks about being in his presence. And I think there's something very precious about that, to realize when we come together to worship the Lord, we're in his presence. When we come together to pray, we're in his presence. We are two or three are gathered together in his name. There, there am I in his midst, in, in his presence. In, Exodus, in uh, Isaiah chapter 6, we see the seraphim saying, holy, holy, holy. We see the glory of God filling the temple. And we read this about him. And Isaiah 6 says, woe is me. I am an unclean man who lives among a people of unclean lips. He realizes the reverence that he has when he's in the presence of God. Revelation chapter 1, John falls as dead when he is in the presence of God. And I'm just trying to say this, there's a certain reverence we need to grow and appreciate when we come into the presence of God. This passage is not just praying to God from a distance. Of course, the resurrected Lord Jesus Christ was in heaven but Paul says, he's in my very presence. And when we pray, he's in our very presence. For this cause, I bow my knees before the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Well, let's go on. I want to go and spend the rest of the time we have in verse 16. Verse 16 of chapter 3. And as we think of this passage, I think it's valuable to think of what he doesn't pray for. What are the things he doesn't, what Paul does not pray for? Well, we see he doesn't pray for material things. He doesn't pray that certain circumstances be removed from these uh, Ephesians or from himself. He doesn't pray and say, Lord, first, as I pray for these Ephesians, Please bring me out of this prison situation that I'm in. He doesn't do that. And the negatives in Scripture are sometimes as significant as what is said. Here, he does not pray for their deliverance. He doesn't pray that God will alleviate some of the problems in their lives. He does not pray that God might bless them. He doesn't pray that God would be good to them in a material way. Now, there may be other times that he does pray for those things, but here he doesn't do that. It's all spiritual things that he prays for. It's all the spiritual upbuilding, the spiritual strengthening that they would have in their lives. 
They had problems, but Paul doesn't say, doesn't pray that, that God would deliver them from their problems. They had tribulations, but God, but Paul does not pray that God would deliver them from their persecution. Let's look at another thing. Scripture never tries to minimize problems or difficulties in the Christian life. If you go through the New Testament, you think about chapter 4 of the book of Acts, if the disciples are persecuted, they, came, they come back to their own company. And what do they say? They pray for a boldness that they may be able to speak about the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. They don't say take away the persecution, but they pray for boldness that they could preach the name of the Lord even, even more so. In Scripture, Scripture, the writers of Scripture never try to minimize problems in the Christian life. Paul or Jesus never say, oh, it's okay. It's all going to work out. Don't worry very much about that. It will work out and pat uh, someone on the back. Never happens, does it? Paul never does that. Scripture never tries to minimize the problems in the Christian's life. And Scripture is always honest. It's always honest about the problems in a Christian's life, in an assembly's life. Take, for instance, John 16, 31. In this world, you will have tribulation, but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. Does it minimize problems? That's honest about problems. You know, in Hinduism, they say the world is all an illusion. The things of the world and the sufferings of the world, it's all an illusion, but Scripture doesn't do that. It doesn't minimize. It's honest about life and problems. Philippians 1.29 is given unto you to believe and to suffer for my sake. 2 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 12. All those who live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer tribulation, persecution. Speaks about the reality of those who are unsaved. Doesn't minimize their problems, their difficulties. Proverbs 13, 15. The way of the transgressor is hard. That's true. That's reality. We have a dear sister in our assembly, her, um, her brother, a lifelong drug addict. He just died. He was in his mid-40s, just died from a drug overdose. The way of a transgressor is hard. I don't want to minimize. I don't want to be heartless and uh, not show kindness to him. But he refused help his whole life. We've known for 20 years. The way of a transgressor is hard. Isaiah 57, verse 21, there is no peace, saith the Lord, unto the wicked. It's true. It's reality. Scripture's honest about the plight of the unsaved. Scripture's honest and straightforward and even blunt about the world we live in. Well, what is the solution then for the believer? What is the solution for the believer? What is the biblical way? Biblical way is not to take away the problems. The biblical way is not to say it's all going to work out. Problems aren't difficult. Problems aren't hard. That's not the solution. The biblical solution is to make us stronger. It's making us stronger so we can meet those problems in life. Look what it says in chapter 16. Oh, sorry. Uh, chapter 3, verse 16 of this passage. Paul is praying, he says, that he would grant you, according to the riches of his glory, that you might be strengthened with might by the Spirit in the inner man. How do we meet problems? We meet problems by being stronger in the inner man. You know, and I know believers who have suffered greatly in sickness, with difficulty, family difficulty, whatever it may be. You know and I know believers 
and you look at them, others look at them, and they say, how do they do it? How do they make it? How do they have joy in their lives? Well, it's strength in the inner man. God's way is not always to take away problems. He does heal. Yes, he does that. But one of his main ways is to make us stronger. Think back about the life of Jonah. The little book of Jonah, chapter two of Jonah, the entire chapter is a prayer. You know what my first prayer would be if I was Jonah in the belly of a great fish? I would pray to get out of the fish. I think you might pray the same thing. But all through that second chapter, he never prays for that. He speaks about seaweed being wrapped around his head. He speaks about being in the, the belly of the great fish. But he never prays to be delivered from his circumstances. But he prays to be stronger. He prays to be obedient. He acknowledges his sin before God. And the first words in chapter 3 in the book of Jonah, of chapter 3, verse 1, at the end of chapter 2, the word of the Lord came to Jonah a second time, preach the preaching that I bid thee. And Jonah did that. The way of God is to make us stronger. In chapter 18 of Luke's gospel in verse 1, men ought to always pray and faint not. When there are problems, when there's difficulties, they don't faint, pray. Men and women must always pray. Prayer, what does prayer do? Prayer fills our lungs with the oxygen of the power of God. If you want to stand under your feet and stand for God, Allow God to fill your life and fill your lungs and fill your, your being, your inner man, with the strength that comes from God. Joe, uh, Jude 20, it says, building yourself up in your own most holy faith. That's how we meet problems, building ourselves up in the strength and the power and the fellowship that we can get from God in our life, strengthening the inner man. Romans chapter 7 and verse 22, it says, I rejoice, or I, let me read that exactly how that is rendered. I delight, I delight in the law of God, uh, in the law of God after the inward man. The word of God gives us strength. Even in the Old Testament, it speaks about this. The joy of the Lord is my strength. What does he mean? It's strength to the inner man. He says, day by day, my outer man, in 2 Corinthians chapter 4 and verse 16, my outer man perishes, but my inner man is renewed day by day. The strength that you get from the inner man. When we get sick, you know, all around me in this room, in my living room, there's bacteria, there's germs, there's probably infection, there's probably viruses, but I don't get sick. You know, the same principle is true of the human body. We're surrounded by those things that attack the human physical body. But how did God design our bodies? He didn't take away all germs out of the world. There might be more and more germs and bacteria and infections all around us. But how did he design the human body? He designed the human body to be strong, to be able to fight off disease, fight off infections, fight off viruses. And he designed us sometimes to be stronger, to exercise, to eat healthy, sometimes to take medicine, sometimes to take a vaccine that our body is stronger to fight off the germs and the bacteria that's around us. And the same thing is true of the Christian life. The same thing is true about the Christian life. The way we become successful in meeting the challenges and the persecutions and all that Satan throws at us and all that the world throws at us, the world, the flesh, and the devil, the way we meet all of those things is to be stronger in the inner man. 
Now our time is about finished. But I want to say this. I want to say just a few more things. What about the unsaved person? What about the unsaved person? You know, the inner man is the believer's heart, renewed mind, renewed spirit of the regenerate man, the soul. That's the inner, that's the inner man. How does the unbeliever meet problems? You know, the, the unbeliever doesn't have an inner man, a renewed, regenerated inner man. They don't have that. They don't have that inner strength to meet the, the challenges and the difficulties of life. And they're crushed under them. They meet great challenges and they're crushed under them. They don't know how to handle them. You can handle them. And they look at you handling them. And when they come to those same problems, they can't handle them. And what do they do? They go and try to build up somehow the outer man. They go to a psychologist. And they go to counseling. And they see if that would encourage them and help them. The weight of it is so great, they find themselves in depression. And they get medications. And if those medications don't work, they get stronger medications. Over and over again, these are the things they do. They take drugs that make them less depressed. They rush into pleasure headlong to try to forget their problems. The believer has that inner man that gets stronger and stronger every day. So Paul here in this passage so beautifully he says, I pray for you believers through the difficulties of life, not to take away the problems. I pray that the Spirit of God would strengthen you by the Spirit. I pray that you have been strengthened by God's Spirit, that you would be strong in the inner man. What a great, what a great principle. Something we can pray for, something we can work on. Fellowship with God, prayer with God, time in his word, time with other believers, strengthening us, strengthening us to take on the fight and the battle and to press on in the Christian life. I think my time is finished, but I appreciate it being with you. Look forward to being with you next week, and uh, I pray that the, the Lord might encourage us some more as we look at the second half of this prayer uh, of the Apostle Paul for the Ephesians in chapter 3. Let's just bow in a word of prayer. Our God and Father, we thank you for our time together. And Father, we pray that you might strengthen us in the inner man. Father, that we would be built up. What a great promise. We have the power of the Holy Spirit, but we need to be strengthened in the inner man to meet some of the great crushing problems in our lives. And so, Father, may we, uh, may we labor to be stronger in our Christian lives. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.